think so. So uh, welcome everybody to our last talk of the day. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, Peter G. Liu. Uh, he's a postdoctoral uh, research fellow in physics at Harvard University, and uh, he focuses on the physics of attractive col colloids integrating uh, high-performance uh, imaging analysis. Uh, he would be talking about uh, um, high throughput analysis of microscopic 3D motion, right? Okay. Thank you. All right, well, thanks uh, to Alina for the generous introduction, and uh, thank you all for being the sort of hardcore that has uh, come to the talk instead of heading early to the beer. I'm perfectly aware that I'm the last barrier between you guys and refreshment, so I'll try to keep this a little bit light. It's uh, obviously a lot of information, very good information that we're hearing in the conference. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're using GPUs to analyze data on a sort of individual or laboratory, single laboratory scale. So a lot of what we've heard of these talks about giant supercomputing clusters, and a lot of that work is emerging out of a community that has a lot of experience with big collections of computers. But you know, so, so it's uh, astrophysics, computational chemistry, computational or combinatorial biology. What happens if you're just an individual and you want to see what you can gain from the GPU? So this is sort of a more workshop level approach. Uh, but yet I think the take home message is going to be that we can actually do new kinds of science on our own scale as a result of the GPU. So I am a postdoc in physics in the laboratory of Professor David Waits at Harvard University. So you may have seen some of like, the pictures of our building in the documentaries. We're in the same building, but not quite in the same place. Uh, and I worked with uh, Dr. Thomas Angelini, who's now a professor in Florida. And uh, basically, the real hero of everything I'm going to tell you about is Frank Yargstorf, who's sitting in the audience, the developer of NPP. And basically, how some of the, work, the, the main crux of what I'm going to talk about has to do with how we're using his library to do really interesting things. Um, and then we're the, some of the physics methods uh, that we're going to be using were developed with collaborators in Milan, in particular Fabio Giovazzi and Roberto Cervino. Uh, and then finally, at, toward the very end, we're starting some new things with optical flow, and I'll just touch on that. And that's being done in collaboration with Andreas Vedel in, uh, at Daimler in Sindelfingen in Germany. So uh, what, what, what are we talking about here? Swimming bacteria, diffusing particles. Why do we even care about any of this? Well, I just show you a static image of pollen grains to mention that in the 1820s, Robert Brown first looked in a microscope and saw these things bouncing around. And that's how he developed this idea of what we now know as Brownian motion. And as the mathematical frameworks evolved, uh, really, I think this was probably first understood or at least popularized. Or Einstein gets credit for it in his miracle year of 1905 as one of his three big papers, I think, was trying to understand or at least parts of these phenomena. So I mean, I'm not really a great historian about that. But uh, generally, it, it goes back to this idea that by looking at things under the microscope, particularly di their dynamic behavior, we can actually understand things about physics. And it ties in with diffusion. And that has more modern connections to fractals and all sorts of things. So even though it seems kind of trivial looking at things moving around a microscope, there's a history of a lot of rich physics that developed as a result. So we have uh, microscopes in the laboratory that allow us to visualize these particles. So I'm just going to show you a typical sequence of these images. Uh, the scale bar here is 5 microns. So these particles are about a micron in size. And we watch them basically bounce around in a fluid. And we added a little dye to the particles so you can actually visualize them bouncing around in the microscope. So this is sort of a slightly updated view of what somebody like Brown might have seen, or at least what he was interested. A whole bunch of stuff diffusing around. And what do we understand about their motion and their structure? <coughs> now, uh, we've heard a lot about this idea of the three pillars of science, and you know, computation, theory, and experiment. And I guess what my question is, are these really sort of three pillars, or are they sort of integrated in a tripod so that in, in the end they're really tied together? And is scientific discovery in the future? I mean, yeah, of course, this is NVIDIA, right? So they want to talk about why computation is going to lead to all these things. But I think in reality, it's a more sensible way to look at it is to say that in reality, you really need all these three things together to make a really comprehensive move forward. And in this case, I think we're going to add computation onto our experiment and get something that each alone wouldn't be able to get. Now, <clears throat> the technique that we're using in our laboratory is confocal microscopy. And that allows us to get true three-dimensional images. So let me step through a little bit about how this works optically. So <clears throat> let's say I have a laser, 
and I shoot it into a microscope. And I'm just using blue as a schematic for the color of that light. The first thing it's going to hit on the inside of the microscope is this dichroic mirror. And dichroic meaning two colors. So it will reflect short wavelengths of light, say blue, and it'll pass longer wavelengths of light, which I'll show later in red. So now that beam comes to the objective lens and then gets focused down to a point in the sample. So this is just a standard microscope where you send light in, it focuses it down to a point, and then at that point you have a sample. So in this case, I've shown you these particles that have a fluorescent dye, and the black business was just a solvent that is invisible. So these particles have a fluorescent dye that then emits at a longer wavelength. So you hit it with blue light, and then it emits red light, for example. That red light is going to pass through this dichroic mirror and go directly to a detector, which you could imagine is just a camera. Right? So this is a very typical setup for a fluorescence microscope in biology. So if you open up a magazine or a book and you see a picture of a cell with like green and red or whatnot, that's essentially all this is. Now, confocal adds a little bit of extra optics. <clears throat> so we're going to add a separate set of lenses that focus the output beam down to a spot. And then it'll expand and go through the other lenses to the detector. Now, why did we bother to do that? Well, the reason that we bothered to do that was that if there's any light that comes from the sample that's not exactly at the focus of the microscope, it's going to get expanded and come through, pass through the mirror, and then hit the parts of the pinhole that are not transparent. So the only contribution to what you get at the detector is just that spot of light exactly at the focus of the microscope. So now you can either move the sample, or you can move with some mirrors or whatever, but you can move that spot around, and now you're building up, voxel by voxel, a three-dimensional image of the structure. So just to, to show you how this works, so this is, a, again, sort of a typical slice we saw from the 2D movie. But now what we're going to do is translate the focus of the microscope, if you will. So it's focusing on a different plane, and we can now build up layer by layer the structure, and then we can locate where those three-dimensional particles are. And uh, we're able to do this with sort of some moderate speed. <clears throat> so say every 30 seconds. And this cluster of particles is moving pretty slowly. So what I can do is calculate the largest cluster, calculate its center of mass, and then move the microscope stage in three dimensions to keep that cluster in the center of field of view. Now I'm rendering this in the case where the color of that cluster is a number of particles. This is sort of your two-dimensional video feed from the center. And then based on how the stage is moving to keep it centered, we can track the three-dimensional position of the particles. Now this was implemented a few years ago, and we used the Intel Performance Primitives libraries to do that, because this stuff, you know, we've got clusters coming in and out, and you can see it, it locks on and target locks that cluster. But we're only scanning once every 30 seconds or so. So because this cluster of particles is moving relatively slowly, we can follow it. But you know, so then we can get then the sort of the full three-dimensional picture. But there's sort of a speed limitation, because you have to take a picture, move this, the, uh, refocus a lens, take another picture. You can't really build a three-dimensional structure any faster than, say, a few times a minute, or maybe oops, um, uh, you know, a few times, yeah, a few times a minute or 10 seconds or whatnot. So if we want to look at these two-dimensional images, now here I've slowed it down by a factor of two or something, but this is going into like 30 or 50 frames a second. If you want to capture the motion of these particles or where there's no, three like no big clusters, they're moving too quickly to do a full three-dimensional scan. So there are lots of situations where we want to understand the dynamics of these kinds of particles, but doing the full three-dimensional reconstruction isn't possible. Or, you know, so if I, if I look here, then let's say I come back 10 seconds later. It's as if I'm coming back 500 frames later in this two-dimensional sequence. And we're going to completely miss any ability to track what's going on from time step to time step. So the three-dimensional stuff is great in the situations where it works. But there are many things that we might want to investigate where just due to the physics of the image acquisition process that we're unable to do that. All right, so we have a new technique called uh, confocal, based on this confocal microscope, differential dynamic microscopy. And so what we do is we take images, and then so an image at a sequence at, a, at time one, and then come back a few frames later, and we take the difference of those two images. And that's to cancel out all the background noise. So maybe the image isn't perfect. Maybe there's a piece of dust on the sample. When you subtract those images, that contribution should disappear. So that's going to give you a set of difference images as a function of the time delay. So what I'm showing you here is just an example of an original image. Now I've taken this image and then subtracted the one that's next in the sequence. So this is being acquired at something like 30 or 50 frames a second. And so the particles have moved just a little bit 
but not a huge amount. And so what you see is just a little bit, I mean, black and white are sort of, I've, it, it's, if it, one is more negative than the other, it's black and the other is white. So it just, it's a sort of intensity map. And I have not, I've used the same normalization for all of these, and I'll point out why that matters in a minute. But you can see that, you know, of course, if you took one image and subtracted itself, it would be strictly zero. Now we step one forward in time, and you can see a little bit of structure. This is now two frames, four frames, eight frames, 16. And as you see that time space the, the delta t increase, the difference in the frames, that interval, you get more and more signal, which makes sense, right? So the particles are moving away, and eventually you get something, you know, if we did another 32, 64, these start to look very similar in terms of their structure because the particles are more or less uncorrelated. So if I look in the infinite time limit, the, a particle at position in one image should be completely decorrelated from another, so this should essentially be random. So we want to characterize that on average. And so what we're going to do is take a Fourier transform of these images. And um, so the, the reason that we do that is we want to get some kind of spatial average of what we say the power spectrum of the image, right? So there's sort of some typical intensity scales, which you can see by your eye, right? You've got these white and black dots. They're sort of separated by a certain distance. And we want to look at how the intensities and the amount of intensity at different length scales is changing as a function of this time delay. So what do we do originally? was just to do this in MATLAB. And now this, you know, so our approach in MATLAB was based on MATLAB of a couple versions ago before all of the GPU stuff was added. So you know, now there may be a faster way to do this in the most recent version of MATLAB when that sort of gets deployed. But um, even then, there's this big problem, which is that at least in the versions of MATLAB that we were using, we've got these TIFF stacks. So I've got sequences of images. They're typically 512 by 512 pixels or 256 by 256. But then there are thousands and thousands of images. So these stacks are you know, hundreds of megs or some, fraction, some rel reasonably large fraction of a gigabyte. So in order to load that into MATLAB, it still takes a long time. So this ends up being a big performance bottleneck when you're actually dealing with real data. And I, I think it's sort of some message that doesn't necessarily get transmitted. If you're actually dealing with large quantities of data, moving it around and loading it into your program is often the biggest bottleneck, much more so than worrying about, well, how many transfers across the PCIe bus? Well, what about your transfer across serial ATA, or worse, like a network or a USB or something, right? You got to move the data around. So it takes a few minutes to load a typical 3D TIFF stack into memory. And then uh, the original approach, as this was implemented by the colleagues in Italy that, that really developed this method, Fabio and Roberto, they would take every image pair, so I've got a, a copy of this 3D stack of images, so x, y, and then in time, and then I take the, uh, an image pair or an image, and then at a certain delta t, I subtract that, I Fourier transform the result, and then I add this to a running total. So that means that for every time interval, I'm only keeping one frame at a time, or sort of one frame. So there's one in the sort of output that gets acquired for every pair separated by, say, three frames. So that for every time difference, you're only holding one frame, and you're using that as an accumulating running total or running average. So the reason that you do that uh, is not particularly efficient, but it allows you to keep the total memory size down. So, and I'll talk about why that matters, but in a typical image sequence of 1,000 frames, which represents an acquisition time of only 10 seconds, because remember, we're acquiring at 30, 50 frames a second, you know, so we're taking tens of seconds of data. The typical execution time was like two to three hours. So this was like painfully bad. This would mean that I would go into the lab, I would take, you know, do a couple of experiments, but then even just a couple of data runs of literally 30 seconds of data or a minute of data in this relatively inefficient or you know, inefficient way of doing it in MATLAB would take two to three hours, which means that I can't look in any sort of interactive form and figure out if this is working, if we're getting anything sensible. <clears throat> so there's a couple of things that we did to improve the MATLAB code, and that is to now take the full stack and then Fourier transform FFT, a 2D FFT on each slice, and then when you're finished, do all of the subtractions in one shot. So it, um, you know, it, it works a bit better. Then you, know, you have to hold, though, all sort of the intermediate stages, and so it's much more expensive in memory, even though you get something like a factor of two or three better in terms of performance. Uh, so in this case, 500 frames would still take about an hour, an hour and a half. I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit casual about these numbers because it was so bad, it just didn't really matter. We couldn't really do anything with it. But the big problem is you actually run out of memory. So on 32-bit windows, with any sort of reasonable version of MATLAB, you run out of memory after 500 frames. And that's bad because then you can't do very good statistics. There's only, you start to get a lot of noise. 
And so, you know, we needed, we needed a new strategy. So enter our hero, Frank, who used his NPP library in combination with the CUDA FFT library to do this now in just a very simple C++ program. And I think it's really sort of a measure of the beauty and the elegance of the libraries that they're creating that you can actually do this in relatively little code. So I've left off all of the painful housekeeping stuff. But what are we doing? Well, basically we load a 3D stack with just an open source library called FreeImage into the memory of the graphics card. And then we just step through the slices and run the FFT on each one. So you know, that's basically uh, all this is, right? Half a dozen lines of code or something, and you now FFT the whole stack. And that's good because with just that, we're leveraging all of the developments. I don't know if you guys went to the talks on the libraries, but anytime they make a development in the CU FFT library, we'll immediately leverage it by just updating a, a driver, or updating the toolkit. And so once that's finished, um, so that, that's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, you could also access the CU FFT in MATLAB. Right, so you don't actually have to write a separate application if all you're doing is accessing the FFT. But where the power of this NPP library comes in is where we're doing all of these subtractions. So basically I have this stack of now the Fourier transform result, and now I have to take every frame and subtract it from almost every frame up to a maximum delta t, right? So all pairs that are separated by delta t equals one frame, all two, all three. So it's sort of like an n squared type of feeling in terms of how it's scaling. And this is where uh, the GPU makes a much bigger difference. So here, um, there's again, just in this function, there's this subtraction between a pair of frames. Yeah, then we, I mean, we square the magnitude, so it's the square of the FFT, but, and then uh, we just add it to the, I guess, this running total. So um, in this case, you're really leveraging the fact that the, G, uh, the GPU is quite efficient at moving data internally. So you can do a lot of subtractions or these squares or whatever. The data is all local on the GPU, and it is much, much faster to do this than for example, on the CPU. And the funny thing is, OK, so what is that? Well, OK, so before we talk about the performance, first of all, we want to make sure that this works. So just showing you a typical example of what happens, the resulting averaged FFT for all pairs of frames at a certain time separation, I'm showing here with the MATLAB code and then here with the GPU. Now, because these particles are sort of isotropic in three dimensions, we average it over that Fourier transform and just keep uh, the sort of radial average. So I basically just start here and then average over all circles, and that gives us this line graph. And then I've subtracted the GPU and the MATLAB code here to give you some idea of the fractional difference. And so you can see that on average it should basically be zero. So as we go through different delta t intervals, you can see that um, that power grows, and that sort of goes back to the initial set of images that you've got stronger black and white, so we're getting much more sort of power in that spectrum. And you can see that things pretty much agree up to some kind of unimportant error. So this is a, a case where we, because there's lots of noise or there's noise in the images, we're not trying to get seven digits of agreement with the CPU. We just want something that's fast because we're doing so much averaging. In the end, we're going to look at, say, the growth of certain length scales or certain kinds of fits. We're not so worried that, that you, know, you should conform to double precision or whatnot. And we really do care. It's much more important, for instance, to run many more images through because we get better statistics that gives us our science as opposed to worrying about some kind of you know, nth decimal error term. All right, so what this does, we're using this combination of NPP and, and the CUDA FFT, it's now down to a minute or two, roughly. I mean, it depends on exactly the size of the sequence. But this is a qualitative performance improvement, and this makes a big difference. Because now if I take 20 seconds of data and I have a basic answer as to what the data is doing after a few minutes, then I can go into the lab, take an afternoon of samples, clean it up in the evening, do the analysis, and then understand what's going on. And uh, you know, that's enough to say, OK, tomorrow I might do a slightly different experiment, or I might look at something else. So I think this is a big qualitative difference between you know, relying on something like MATLAB or using the, the GPU approach, because it actually allows us to be much better scientists because we've moved into a semi-interactive regime. Now, in terms of the actual performance of what's going on, so yes, in the MATLAB part, you can call the FFT on the graphics card, and that will certainly give you a performance improvement. But it turns out these subtractions, MATLAB, in, at least in the way I coded it, and, and maybe the people at MathWorks could fix this, but the way, the way we were coding it, 90% of the time was doing all these pairs of subtractions. 
the FFT, you know, so I, in a, say an hour run, maybe the FFT in total took a few minutes, but 95% of the execution time was all of these subtractions. So there's a case where the library that, that they've optimized for MPP makes an enormous difference in the ultimate result. So the loading is faster, the FFT is a bit faster, but we've now gotten this sort of 50x speed up by being much more efficient in all those subtracted pairs. All right, so what exactly are we going to do with all of this? Right? Well, what exactly do we learn scientifically? So here, again, I've just changed the sort of color map. But this is, and now the origin is here. This is a typical average of, say, a thousand pair or a thousand image sequence. We've averaged all pairs that are separated. I think this is by like 20 frames. And when you do all of that averaging, you can see that there's actually very relatively little noise. And then we do another further average azimuthally or sort of over the circles to get a radial plot. And that's what we're showing here. So this gives you now as a function, and this is now in, in Fourier space. So this is the Fourier transform. So it's a one over distance. It's a spatial frequency. And then the amount of, say, energy or intensity or whatever at each of those frequencies is shown by this plot. So this is at a given separation in time of the image pairs of, say, 20 frames. So now what we want to do is plot this function as a function of the separation in time. And that gives us sort of this plot up here. So this graph here, you can imagine now, I'm gonna, this is going to be one slice in this plot, which I'm showing with this white vertical rectangle. All right. So now, instead of having a height here, I'm now representing the intensity, sort of the y-coordinate here, with the color map there. And now I'm replacing the x-axis, or I'm showing along the x-axis for different time separations. So on the left side here is the delta t equals 1. So this is you know, one frame later, two frames later, up to whatever this is, like 20 frames. And we've now stacked this together. So this gives us an idea of how things are decorrelating as a function of the separation of time in terms of images. And this is sort of a, a weird way of plotting it. But the next thing we're going to do is now slice horizontally, which I'm showing in the blue rectangle. Now I can plot that down here. And what you see is this delta function, this sort of power in this, this spectrum is growing exponentially until it saturates to essentially where the images are decorrelated. So in this sequence, if in the infinite time limit, there's a certain amount of decorrelation that's essentially random. And as you get closer in time back to delta t equals 0, they recorrelate. So the amount of energy in this decorrelation plot, if you will, grows exponentially. So now we're just going to fit this to an exponential function. And that gives us a couple parameters. It gives us a sort of a baseline noise term. It's an amplitude. And this is basically 1 minus e to the some kind of function times delta t. So then we get an exponential time constant. So we've got those parameters. So what, what, what can we do with this? Well, so if we fit just the time constant, so I guess I should have written the equation, but it's basically e to the minus t over tau. So it's a, a characteristic time constant. I can now plot that. <clears throat> so I do this fitting right at, for every line. And now each one of these, again, the vertical dimension here is the spatial frequency, which I've represented by the letter Q. So from these fits, uh, now I'm putting Q here, and I'm putting the fitting to the time constant up here. You can do it for all these different images, or the, the different, this is all sort of from one sequence of a very dilute spectrum of particles. So we have two different kinds of microscopes, and you can see, so there's some, some plateau here due to optical characteristics. But just concentrate up here. And you see that it follows a power law scaling of uh, 1 over q squared. So that is the, 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 the time constant decreases as the square of the inverse distance is the, re the relation you get for diffusion. So we're actually able to measure diffusion and measure the diffusion constant. So the slope of this, or the, the value of this line, I mean, the, the slope, it gives you the exponent, but exactly where this is up and down actually allows you to read off the diffusion constant. So actually, this method is a way to, when you're looking at particles, you can actually measure the diffusion constant, which is pretty interesting. Because how are you, for instance, going to measure the diffusion constant of things that are maybe a little bit more messy? But in this case, we have a very clean particle system. All the particles are the same size. What we can do is something called dynamic light scattering, where you shine a laser at a certain angle, and then you look at the photons coming off and their time correlations. And there's a whole apparatus that's built to do that. That's what the black symbols are. But this allows us then to show that there's quantitative agreement with existing uh, other independent measurements and techniques. So the reason that this is useful for us is not that we care about the diffusion constant, but once you know the viscosity of the solvent, you can actually measure very precisely what the size of the particles are. 
So going back to that movie, I told you that the particles are a micron in size, but the wavelength of light they were using, visible light is from 400 to 700 nanometers. You can't just zoom in and get infinite resolution to figure out how big your particles are. So by using this dynamic technique and relying on statistics, we can actually size our particles to you know, plus or minus a few nanometers, where it's impossible to visualize that with light because you have the diffraction limit. So you're never going to see anything underneath you know, 300 nanometers. You can play certain kinds of tricks to get maybe a couple hundred nanometers, but you certainly couldn't look at an object, a micron in size, and be able to say that when it's moving in a fluid, it's radius to a few nanometers. Now, you could imagine taking it out and putting it in an electron microscope, but then you have to dry it. And if these particles have solvent in them, they're going to collapse or they're going to deform. So this is a way to measure in situ exactly what the size is. And then the other thing that we want to be able to do is to look at the structure of the collection of particles. And so if you heard the keynote this morning or just went to some of the molecular dynamics talks, there's a lot of energy that they're using to calculate the radial distribution function. And they talked about it in the keynote. And that says, OK, if I have the three-dimensional coordinates from a simulation of a particle at x, y, z, and then I want to say, what's the probability that going out a distance r, so radially in three dimensions, am I going to find another particle? So they have a whole bunch of ways when you have the three-dimensional particle coordinates to calculate that. And there was a nice talk in the last session about how they do that. So what I'm showing you here is the static structure factor, which is simply the one-dimensional Fourier transform of the radial distribution function. So we can calculate this from just these image sequences. So what I'm showing you here in the solid symbols is with this two-dimensional technique. I guess I should probably do this for the, the, the solid symbols here are the two-dimensional technique that I've just talked to you about. So now we're fitting. Uh, so we, we use the time constant to get the diffusion constant from that fit. If we now take the amplitude and divide this out for a very dilute set of particles, we can now calculate instantaneously this structure factor for colloidal, these sort of suspensions at different densities. And you can compare it to the open symbols here, is, or if I go through in three dimensions and just take a snapshot and get the three-dimensional positions and calculate it explicitly. So in this case, this works, but I'll show you some cases where it doesn't work. And then finally, the solid line is the theoretical calculation. If you know that you have spheres at a certain size and a certain density, you can manually go through and calculate what the static structure factor or the radial distribution function should be. So that's known sort of from theory. And we get things to completely agree for a bunch of different densities. So I'm just, this is sort of more of a validation of the method. But I do want to point out that just from these image sequences, we never really explicitly f had to decide what was a particle. We weren't, aren't doing any particle tracking. Whereas those 3D methods r rely explicitly on finding the centers of the particles, reconstructing them in three dimensions, and so here, you know, we're, making, we're not even making an assumption. Like We know that the particles are spheres because I'm telling you this, but nothing in the method actually relies on that. So we're actually able to calculate these radial distribution functions without explicitly saying what a particle is. And that's something I think is pretty interesting. Uh, you don't have to sort of go through and try and calculate explicitly what the 3D structure is. Now, I would also point out that we're taking a purely two-dimensional measurement and an analysis purely in two dimensions, but yet the three-dimensional particle location and the three-dimensional theory, it's all in agreement because we're working basically under the assumption that diffusion is isotropic in three dimensions. So there's some, some mathematics that goes into this. But remember, we're not measuring anything in 3D, and yet we're able to build the 3D radial distribution function that agrees with theory. So I think that's kind of cool. All right, so, so I've shown you here that this, you know, we can take a three-dimensional collection of images statically and that it agrees with the theory. But what else can we do? I mean, is there other things that are more novel about this? Well, one thing we can do is start to measure the hydrodynamic factor. And this is not possible doing it in 3D. If you take a slice and then move and locate the particles, that gives you a static shot. Yes, you can get the structure, but you don't know how these things are moving hydrodynamically because you're only sampling once every 10 seconds or something. So by doing this at 50 frames a second, we can do a few more transformations. And I mean, the, the equations, um, hopefully we'll have a paper out on this soon. The equations are actually relatively straightforward. So there's nothing, you're basically just dividing out a few things. It's all algebra. But you can then more or less instantaneously get the hydrodynamic factors. And there isn't really any real convenient way to measure this, particularly these high densities of, say, 40% particles or whatnot. So this is another sort of characterization method that more or less falls out for free. <clears throat> All right, so I've sort of given you this perfect model system where we have these particles that we can see in three dimensions, and we can capture them in 2D or 3D. And so in a way, is this technique an academic exercise, or does this actually allow us to do something new? Well, 
what I didn't, what I, uh, with this sequence of particles, <coughs> the particles are almost purely white. The background is uniform and black because we've engineered the sample to have a very close match in index of refraction between the particles and the solvent. So when you look deep into the sample, you can see it, the sample is transparent. You can see almost all the way through it. But that's not very useful if you actually want to look at many things in the real world, right? Most liquids aren't transparent. If they've got stuff in it, they get cloudy. Well, why are they cloudy? That's because the index of refraction of the things floating around in the liquid, say bacteria or yeast or anything, or milk, you know, proteins, are not the same as the water. So a much more typical situation is where you have a material that's semi-transparent and so here I've put particles in there with a solvent that has a different index of refraction, you can see that the contrast is much lower. I mean, of course, you can sort of scale it, one, the, the intensities, but I've sort of left it more or less comparable. But you know, the, what the, the difference between the brightest and the darkest is not very much. And if you were to spread it out, you, know, you could contrast enhance it, but then there would just be a lot more noise. So in this case, if we want to uh, do a 3D uh, reconstruction. So compare this to the movie where I showed you the reconstruction. But now, as we're looking deeper into the sample, you can see that the contrast is fading and the noise is a lot worse. Right? So now we want to look deep into the sample to try, if we wanted to try 3D reconstruction, this isn't going to work so well because what the quality of the image is degrading as we look deeper into the sample. So in this case, if we want to reconstruct it, what do we do? So this is now a slice that I took with the microscope sort of perpendicular to the lens. So it's a sort of an XZ stack, if you will. So instead of XY, all these images have sort of been what you would look at here. What this microscope is doing is it's taking a line and then moving the sample, taking another line. So we're building it up in this direction. And you can see that the contrast basically disappears. So if you're relying on a 3D algorithm to build the structure of a sample like this, you've got no data here, or you've got so much more noise that it's not going to be very reliable. And in fact, I can show you the central location. If I'm trying to find the two-dimensional centers of these particles, this is, I'm now showing it in red, and this is on that same sequence. You can see that, if this plays, yeah, as we get deeper into the sample, we start to miss more and more particles until finally, you know, is this noise, are we actually, are we actually accurate? So let me just rewind and show you um, back to the sort of perfect test case here, you can see that the quality of the image is, is more or less constant at different heights. Right? You don't see any sort of noticeable change. So this is because we've done some chemical tricks to keep everything happy and keep the index of refraction, con uh, index of refraction constant. But now when we get to the more general case where the solvent and the particles don't match, then you could see that this is just not working out so well. All right, so is there something that this 2D technique can do to rescue us a bit? And in that case, there actually is. So now this is a case where the optics may be bad, but the physics is not. So even though you can't see the particles, it doesn't mean that their diffusion somehow went wacky. Their diffusion is still the same. So what we can do is now park at the top of the image stack and then run this two-dimensional differential dynamic microscopy algorithm and reconstruct this uh, static structure factor, again, the Fourier transform of that radial distribution function, which I'm showing in purple. And that, uh, that purple line is exactly what the theory would predict. If we tried to do it from the 3D reconstruction, I'm showing you that in blue, and it completely misses it. It would imply either that the particles are a different size, or in this case, that uh, the volume is different, because we've just missed so many particles. So there's an example where this technique is both easier and it's more robust in a number of situations. Now, I've sort of shown you all of these particles bouncing around. I mean, is that really interesting, or is this, you know, why are we bothering to do this? Well, ultimately, I think we want to understand things that are of relevance to sort of physical aspects of biology. And so here, what I'm showing you in the same microscope setup are uh, Bacillus subtilis, a bacteria swimming around against a cover slip. And so the reason that you see them all rod-shaped is you're looking right up against the surface, and so they're all swimming essentially in two dimensions. But now we can start to think about, you know, can we start to understand their motion as a result of applying similar techniques, but now to this. So I would say that, you know, the colloids are interesting, but really we want to validate the technique and show that it gives quantitatively correct information we can compare with theory, and then we'll turn it around and start to see if we can ask new questions about what's going on with the bacteria. So this is the bacteria at the surface. And then this, if we sort of go into the bulk, uh, so say 20 microns from the cover slip, you can now see they're swimming around. Uh, but now they're not all horizontal, right? Because you've got some moving up and down. You've got some moving sideways. 
and we can now start to perform those same procedures as far as image analysis. And you know, what do we actually get? What can we actually see? All right, so the first thing is we can, um, so instead of having that perfectly sort of one over tau uh, diffusive motion behavior, we actually get something different. We get a, a stretched exponential in the, uh, so instead of the, that thing, that, okay, so instead of this function rising, I probably should have put more equations in here. So this is just a simple exponential. It's basically 1 minus e to the delta t over tau, right? So that, that's what this simple function is. In order to, for the bacteria, it doesn't obey that simple relation. Instead, it obeys a one over this sort of 1 minus e to the delta t over tau, and that whole quantity is taken to a power. In this case, it's like 1.4. So when we do that, we can get all the data to scale on itself. And first of all, that allows us to get a velocity probability distribution function so we can measure how the bacteria are moving. And we can also see that uh, if we plot now this tau in the scaled regime, the slope of this on a log-log plot is 1. So that implies ballistic motion. So what that means is that the bacteria are, it's as if they're swimming in a straight line for a distance over which we can measure it. And because of that, we can sensibly then extract a transverse velocity distribution. And now it's a way just by looking at the 2D images to get a velocity distribution of the bacteria. And this is something I think is not otherwise easily measured, right? How do you get a population distribution of the velocities in a bunch of swimming bacteria? Well, this basically comes out for free once you just run it through that sequence, get those Fourier transforms, and then do some pretty simple analysis. So, I mean, I think that's something that's been pretty new. So I, uh, I'm, let me just uh, draw this to a close so we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, so why does a GPU matter in this case? So we're taking minutes, not hours, to get results, whether it's from these particles or whether it's from the bacteria. I haven't sort of gotten to the point where it's sitting next to me on the microscope, but you know, the bacteria, they don't live forever. You can only do these experiments for a couple of hours before they run out of food and die. So you know, it's useful to be able to get some feedback, if not while you're doing it, by the next day. And so you know, this is a big qualitative improvement, not just quantitative in what we're actually able to measure, and it allows us to do a lot more measurements. I would also say that you know, as a result of the software, um, we can take a lot more data. So 100x analysis speed up is equal to 100 times more data that you can analyze in a given time. And because a lot of what we're doing relies on statistics, that makes a big difference. So now we can take sequences of many, many thousands of images, and that gives us really beautiful correlations and allows us to pick out some of these differences, like say the velocity distribution, where if there's too much noise, you're just not going to get anything sensible. And now, I mean, I think maybe the best testament is that we use this for a lot of different characterizations. Let's say you have a collection of particles, you want to know their size, you just toss them into the microscope, take a few thousand frames, run it through the, the code, and in a few minutes, you have a very accurate measurement of the size. And that's something that, you know, experimentally is very useful. Right? You want to know how big your particles are because then maybe we're going to do some 3D experiments and we need to know how to set our distances at the time scales. That's, uh, you know, I think maybe the best testament is that we're using it. It's not so exciting that the GPU is doing everything, but it's just part of our normal workflow. All right, so that's where we're at with this uh, differential dynamic microscopy technique. Where we want to go, let me just show you a couple of slides, is what happens when the bacteria get really dense. Well, in this case, this is at the cover slip, and then this is in the bulk. And you can start to see some really big swarms and swirls, right? So it's really massively disturbed. And this is something that I don't think people have really explored so much yet, because it's not so easy. You need a microscope that can take data at 50 frames a second, and these things are sort of half million dollar instruments, and then you need to make the bacteria fluorescent and grow them. I mean, it's not so easy to do this experimentally, and so I think that even though people have looked, there's been a beautiful literature on the study of organisms swimming. We're starting to get to regimes where um, you know, there's, there's some new stuff here. So how do we even think about these dynamics? And so, um, and now, as they get denser and you get more deep, if you want to know the true 3D behavior, again, you've got to get away from that cover slip. And so this is sort of the, the final movie here. And you can see now that even with your eye, you can't really pick out what's an individual bacterium, right? It wasn't like that low-density case near the cover slip where you could maybe track them. Here, what's bacteria? What's noise? Well, there's a huge amount of scattering. It's going at like 50 frames a second. We're deep in the sample. There's fluorescence. So what we're trying to do now is apply some optical flow algorithms so that you don't actually have to, you know, it's not based on this paradigm of tracking things. So, you know, it's nice if you could see them discreetly, but there are many situations where that's not really possible. 
And I think the interesting thing here is, what is your brain doing? You see these swarms because your brain is essentially building correlations between frames, right? I mean, you've got this stuff swirling around, and I can point this out to you with my finger, but if we stop the movie, whoops, you don't get anything, right? Where's the swarm? Where's the swirl? So I think this is actually a very interesting problem from a computation standpoint, because we need to start looking at correlations of frames in a new way. And it's not something that you can just address one frame at a time. So I think that, you know, so hopefully we'll talk to some experts here if you guys have any ideas on how to do this. And we have some optical flow code, but this is so far out of the test cases of images that people tend to look at. You know, say machine vision, you've got everything in the scene moving in sort of some relatable way. If it's, you know, sort of going forward, you're scaling it or rotating it or translating it. Here we've got all this stuff sort of making a big mess. So we'd like to understand better what we can pull out of that data. So I think I hope to convince you that um, there's a lot of interesting things that you can even do with GPUs on the sort of single laboratory scale that we can start to access new kinds of science. You know, if this, there's some traditional, even with just a preview of the optical flow stuff, the CPU-based things take, you know, 10 seconds of frame, 20 seconds of frame. Well, now if I have a sequence of thousands of frames, we have to dedicate three hours to look at one of these sequences, right? That's not so good. So now the GPU accelerated algorithms, we're not sure that they're right, which is why I'm not showing you the results, and we have to validate the data. But now we're back down to a, a fraction of a second per frame pair. Then we're back in the regime where we can actually do something useful. So you know, there's lots of traditional stuff out there as far as tracking particles or tracking bacteria. But there's, I think, hope to convince you that there are regimes where that's just not going to cut it. And it's only because we've got a great deal of acceleration that we can start to do these practical experiments and hopefully learn something new. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.